information uh, about thermography. Uh, and Gunnar Vossner had also done some work with this. And you know, they were impressed by the, uh, by the fluctuation. Uh, and it's my contention that, that uh, at least the trend group was always looking at a subacute population. In Chicago, I get people that are 10 years out. The Candy's, uh, Candy's people that you know, have become you know, fairly hopeless about getting cured and they have lowered expectations or different expectations, but you'll tell us all about that next year, right? Okay. Um, but, but that's, you know, that's, that's, I didn't really think of that as uh, 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 inflammatory imaging, but I guess it is, and I guess we've done that, so there's that topic. But I wanted to talk a little bit about my work with, uh, with Vanya, because he, he's back in the brain here, and, and his role, of course, is, is, uh, is to be the genius, you know, with, with his genius is. I mean, I've never seen a group as smart as the group that's working with Vanya, just Stone cold genius kids that work with him, uh, Paul Geha, who has gone on to residency in in, uh, in psychiatry, uh, and uh, a guy that works with him still is Baliki, uh, who's uh, uh, I mean these kids are obviously going to go on to great careers, uh, but they had they had done this work that I'm going to talk about uh, ultimately. Uh, and it goes to the brain stuff. Now, my role on this team is to A, keep them honest, keep them real in terms of clinical design, because fortunately for me, they're completely clueless about all this. They've never seen, none of them have ever seen a patient. So that gives me uh, job security with them. But then I have a, a, a less pleasant job on the back end, which is trying to interpret what does this mean? What does this mean to our patients? What does this mean to me as a clinician? Uh, and these are conversations that can get, um, how do you say, very frisky. Uh, Vanya and I have a lot of very frisky conversations about what it all means. And I, and I want to talk a little bit about that uh, when we get there. Okay. Now, the first thing I want to point out here, if I have a pointer, I can point with my finger, I guess, but why not use the technology when you can? This is the first time I've ever used this terminology in public. But the nucleus accumbens and the ventral, tegment, ventral tegmental area in the brain are, of course, those areas of the brain that are associated with, quote, reward, motivation, and addiction. Well, I look at them and say, well, you know, they're in that part of the brain that's associated with positive reinforcement or reward, but they're also, of course, intimately associated with the yang of that yin and yang equa equation, their punishment, their suffering, their pain is feeding into these areas. But what we see is rather profound changes in the responsiveness of this areas in chronic pain diseases. So what is it? When, when we first started talking about nucleus accumbens, uh, I'm a neurologist and, you know, I couldn't remember it from medical school, but that's not unusual at my age. So I went back to my old textbooks and there was no such thing. There was no nucleus accumbens. It didn't exist in any of the books I had. So I got newer books and they weren't in the newer books. So I googled it and you know sure enough there it is. You know, <laughs> I, I guess the nucleus accumbens just evolved in the last three years. I, what do you think, Dr. Davis? Is, is that what happened? It just, it wasn't there. You know, it's not like this thing where it's a little nubbin of flesh that, you know, is real distinct. It's just kind of a confluence. It's like Chicago, where, where the rails come from the East Coast and the West Coast and the South, and they all come together. That's pretty much how you would characterize nucleus accumbens. And I would throw in, I keep throwing in, this is one of those frisky conversations that Karian and I have, but there's also this ventral tegmental area. Uh, which is part of the reward system as well. Um, it, it's important to note that you know many, many things feed into these, these reward areas or punishment areas, if you will. Uh, you know, there's amygdala, locus ceruleus. Uh, amygdala brings agreeable versus disagreeable uh, information uh, to the equation here. Uh, of course, the hippocampus brings memories of pain and pain relief and you know when I had that pain before this is what I did to avoid it or I took this drug or I went to see this doctor for this therapy. Uh, and then the ancillary cortex uh, which is 
a desire for relief and a desire for reward and pleasure. And this, of course, is coming from the addiction literature. Now, the most work that's been done in these areas is, is coming from addiction liter literature. Uh, and you would, you, know, you would think, you look at this area, and this is to convince you, it's just not a real clear, distinct area. I just put kind of a little red dot on it. Uh, you know, it's, the, it's the, the bottom of the cingulate or the top of the brain stem, but it really is well positioned to, to do all that confluence of information, sensory information, but information coming down from limbic structures, cortical structures. Uh, but it, it, this, is, this is not like new. It's not like we really uh, uh, just figured this out because uh, Olds and Milner in 1954 was sticking electrodes into this uh, in animals and, and turning it on, and, and they had all the behaviors associated with positive reward or positive reinforcement just simply from stimulation of the area. And of course, this was the animals that stimulated unto death. They stopped eating, they stopped sleeping, they stopped mating, they didn't do anything but, you know, but publish until and they would starve to death uh, uh, with, uh, with stimulation in these areas. Um, uh, and here's another picture uh, showing where I, you know, where I kind of think we're talking about with nucleus accumbens. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, there, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of things coming into this besides just, uh, you know, the amygdala, uh, et cetera. Uh, important information from insula uh, comes into this area. Uh, hypothalamus, the septum. Uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, if it's not, you know, completely obliterated, <laughs> Uh, uh, certainly has activity and, and has input into this. Um, uh, and then uh, it's also important to remember that this, uh, like everything else in the brain, it's not just sitting there getting all this input uh, and passively, you know, accepting all of that. Of course, the whole reason is output. So this leads to motor outputs, as this indicates, but it leads to behavioral outputs which is the point I want to make uh, about the operant rheostat uh, 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 that I believe is, uh, is, uh, comes from this area. Um, it's important to note that you know, there's a variety of neurochemicals that are involved in, in, in causing this to, to fire or not fire, be active or not active, and of course with the behavioral or the motor outflow. Uh, and you know, people talk about dopamine, of course, big in the reward system. Uh, uh, serotonin uh, is important in terms of its modulating effects. For instance, dopamine is desire, I want that steak, but then after you eat the steak, serotonin kicks in and says, ah, oh, that was cool, that was good, or satiety. Uh, but, the, but, but clearly opioid systems project very strongly to this, and this is where it overlaps with addictionology, uh, of course. Uh, but also, if you look at these areas, they have cocaine receptors. They have cannabinoid receptors. They have um, amphetamine receptors, nicotine receptors. So a lot of the things in our society, a lot of those chemicals out there that attract certain segments of the population, you know, it has receptors in this, uh, this reward system. Uh, and then from amygdala, uh, I'm supposed to remind myself in prefrontal cortex, there's, there's uh, stimulation uh, along the uh, uh, glutaminergic um, uh, pathways. So, here's just a picture uh, trying to emphasize the fact that the output can be behavioral, like I say, and this is stimulation of other areas of the brain that, that guide behavior, you know, whether or not to run away. You know, the fight or flight response. You know, you, 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 you're in a burning building, you get burned, you run away. But there is an override uh, that can occur, of course. Uh, the mother who doesn't run out of the bur burning building until she rescues her baby doesn't feel any pain, runs out of the building. You know, she's got third degree burns, but she saved her child. So, so clearly, you know, this is not a reflex in the sense of, uh, stimulus response, it, it's very complicated and can be overridden behaviorally by multiple areas of the brain. Um, uh, yeah, this is just to remind me that, you know, there's opioid receptors, nicotine receptors, I already said it, 
uh, cocaine, uh, you know, you can't see this very well, ethanol, um, many, of these, uh, many of these things in society uh, that people are attracted to, that give them reward, and then sometimes they lose control over these behaviors in terms of seeking this continuous reward, uh, are, are live right here uh, in the operant rheostat. So uh, the work that Vanya had done, it, it, was, uh, it was very interesting, and he showed a differential change between uh, gr a group of patients which was actually subacute and a group of patients that was, was clearly chronic. They had different responses, particularly in nucleus accumbens, and then I'm arguing with them about whether or not the, the, the VTA is involved. Um, but identical acute noxious thermal stimuli produce similar patterns of sensory activations in chronic back pain patients and in healthy controls elicit distinct patterns of nucleus accumbens activity in the two groups. Uh, you know, and here's the pretty pictures. Um, my psychologists like to talk, call this globology. You know, they don't believe in any of this stuff. And you say, well, what? So you got colored blobs in the brain. What does that mean? Well, that's... You know, that's my role. That's our role. Uh, I think of a lot of the people in this room, what, what does it mean when these things happen? And you have, you know, the healthy, and this is the response in that area. Uh, and then you have the chronic back pain patients, and you see that there's a, d a different response in terms of this particular stimulation pattern. Uh, but what, what happens uh, in general is uh, dopamine neurons decrease firing with aversive stimulus, which makes sense. It's not rewarding. So, so the output of, of the nucleus accumbens is either to fire if it's pleasurable, happy, good, uh, or not fire if it's pain, suffering, bad. Okay? So if you have aversive activity, not well defined, uh, it has de uh, uh, decreased firing. Uh, but increased firing when the bad thing stops. So it's very important to note that cessation of pain is positive reinforcing. So when, when, it, when you stop the pain in our healthy volunteers, uh, they have a big burst, a phasic burst uh, of activity from nucleus accumbens into the reward system. So it's rewarding to effectively avoid or stop the pain. Now this is interesting. When somebody cannot effectively avoid or stop the pain, as in all our chronic pain conditions, you know, and then everything goes goes to heck, you know, because there, there's never that there's never that reward, there's never that turn off of the pain, and it just goes on and on and on, and now it causes, I think, structural changes, glial changes, all kinds of heck breaks loose. Uh, in the nervous system if you cannot effectively avoid the pain. I mean, the whole purpose is you got damaging or potentially damaging stuff in the environment, and you avoid that, fight or flight. But if you can't run away from the back pain, can't run away from the CRPS in your leg, what happens? Well, we think this happens. In normals, they don't have these phasic bursts when you stop this experimental pain. We just, you know, we just burn them with the PLTA on their back while they're in the MRI. So it's an acute pain stimulus superimposed now in terms of chronic. But when you turn it off, or when they turn it off, or they know that it's eventually going to turn off, they don't get this phasic burst in the reward. They get that continuous negative reinforcement or not firing. So... Uh, there's a lot of details of this, but, but I, I really have to say, you know, there's tonic activity, there's phase as well, uh, in, which is increased with reward and positive behaviors. So the tonic activity popping out with positive things that we can measure out in the world, positive behaviors like uh, moving the affected part, as opposed to the negative, which is if I move the affected part, it's going to be painful for me. So you get this real dynamic that really strongly reinforces not moving the affected part. So what in the world can we do to charge this up and get people motivated for? You know, reward and motivation are intimately associated. How can we provide the motivation now 
to move the affected part. We know that is a good, positive behavior. So I, I think what I want to do, let me see, I don't have any more slides. What I want to do, if, if you'll indulge me for a minute, and Mark's going to let me, uh, I'm going to do one step before I go to the Samoan circle. I, I'm, I'm suspicious about this Samoan circle. It sounds very civil and all that, but I know that they got a box of rotten tomatoes in the back. So, All right. I'm just going to draw, draw this, uh, this rheostat out for you again, just, just one time, and then, uh, uh, and then I'll shut up. So you have reinforcers in the environment. You know, and they, you have the positive and you have the negative reinforcers. So I'm just reducing this to a strict operant paradigm. You know, in this here, remember, this is relief of pain or, or the, the successful avoidance of, of, of ongoing pain or running away from that saber-toothed tiger that may well bite you in the thigh. Uh, you know, this is sex. Everybody should wake up here. Sex! You know, this is food. You know, this is all that's left me. You know, at my age, the, the only bad habit or positive reinforcing thing I got is food. Uh, you know, but, but you know, for the, some other people out there in the world, the, this reminds me of, uh, uh, what is this, breaking bad here? You know, amphetamines and cocaine, you know, this is highly rewarding for some people, so I'll just put coca here. Um, and then the negative reinforcers, you know, what? Pain. The inability to effectively achieve relief. So no relief. Suffering fear, you know, which in, in, in chronic situations, this fear, this, this inability to do fight or flight, you know, the, the, the sympathetic nervous system gets supercharged. And what is the uh, behavioral uh, uh, consequence of that? Well, I think it, it, that it ultimately develops into anxiety. And we can measure that. You know, now we're into validated instrumentation and everybody knows what anxiety is, right? But, so, but you have these things feeding into this, uh, this uh, 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 rheostat, the operant rheostat, which is nucleus accumbens uh, and VTA. Now, importantly, remember, it's not just uh, you know, the brain sitting there passively saying, oh, this sucks, or oh, this is great, but there's response. And the behavioral response, the operant response, can be characterized as what we as clinicians call good behavior and bad behavior. Bad behavior, this kinesiophobia. You know, when I do that, it hurts, so I'm not going to do that anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to do anything, and then you get disuse atrophy, and now that's part of the disease. Uh, you know, the fight or flight is, uh, is uh, uh, perverted. You know, people become... As Candy said, they become isolated, they become sad, and, and they stay at home, and they don't do anything. Uh, and, the, you know, they're always trying to get out of this. They're trying to feed over here. So, an, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a doctor offers them opioids, you know? And it, yes, it, it is positive reinforcing short term. It's exogenous. It suppresses exogenous system, so it's not really good, uh, but, but, you know, it temporarily moves the bar back in a, in a pleasant, uh, what would these things be? Positive behavior, just a sense of well-being. And a lot of my patients say, oh, you know, they take opioids and they say, for the first time in a long time, I, I, I feel better, I feel good, I, I feel like maybe I can go out and enjoy the weather. Uh, or enjoy um, Albuquerque. This is a beautiful place you live in. Um, you know, they become social. They become happy. As opposed to, over here, sad. Okay? So the question for the circle is, you know, it, it, this, is, this is caveat. This is, you know, this is all my theory about how it works, what it means, but that's kind of my job. 